Now we would like to introduce this year's Building Bridges keynote speaker. I had the opportunity to listen to Dr. Joy DeGruy at the White Privilege Conference 2010 and knew that she was the ideal fit for this year's theme of the conference. Dr. Joy DeGruy, formerly Leary, is a world-renowned author, professor, and activist. Dr. DeGruy holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Communications, a Master's degree in Social Work, a Master's degree in Psychology, and a PhD in Social Work Research. She works as an assistant professor at Portland Uni State University. She has written countless articles and books, including Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, which is the basis for her speech. I can tell you from personal experience that the next hour and a half will be thought-provoking, emotionally challenging, and inspiring in countless ways. Some of you will feel rage, frustration, others sadness and disbelief, but I guarantee every single one of you will leave with a completely new understanding of slavery and its connection to the present. Please help us welcome Dr. Joy DeGruy. first 30 minutes to figure out that what I'm talking about is real. And I appreciate not having to do that here. I appreciate not having to um, uh, explain the relevance of it. Uh, I want to again applaud <coughs> the performers. You did a masterful job of bringing that reality to us on a number of different levels. You've made this job for me much easier. <coughs> I wanted to say, and it's kind of been prefaced, that what I'm going to share with you uh, is a 10-week graduate course. I'm going to put it in an hour and a half. <laughs> and because it's going to be so condensed, it's going to feel really intense because I have to move through a lot of material. Um, and the PowerPoint, which I don't see yet, and kind of need to, <laughs> uh, is, is going to be very useful. So it's, you know, it's not going to be kind of dry, and, you know, you're falling asleep kind of thing. So let me kind of, first of all, talk about post-traumatic slave syndrome, how I arrived at it. Very often when, um, when we're faced with the term slavery, particularly if you're a person of African descent, what, we, what we've often received is a great deal of pushback around that. Ah, oh, come on now. Surely, surely you people aren't getting ready to try. First of all, what excuses are you trying to find out? Who are you trying to blame? And, and guess what? I wasn't there, okay? I didn't own any slaves. I, you know, I wasn't, well, guess what? I wasn't there either. But what we have to understand is that there is a feeling of discomfort. My daughter calls it a a subtle contempt that we have. And we don't know why we have it, particularly when black people start talking about slavery. And I wondered about that as a social scientist. In fact, that was the first thing I noticed was just the response to the, just the title, post-traumatic slave syndrome. Just the title. And I wondered about why I was experiencing such pushback. The first chapter in my book, which is called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, America's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing. When I first wrote the book, I wrote the book for the intent of healing. That's the whole reason. The whole purpose of my work is healing. But you can't heal that which you don't understand. Randall Robinson wrote the foreword to my book. I can't really explain to you who he is. You can Google him. He's an 
amazing man. Um, he wrote The Debt, and he wrote Quitting America, one of uh, his more popular books. But Randall said to me, the worst thing you can do to a people is to rob them of the memory of themselves. We can't possibly know where we're going if we don't know where we came from. We can't possibly embrace who we are if we cannot honor the shoulders upon which we stand. So the first chapter of my book is called, I Don't Even Notice Race. Now, a lot of people of color have heard, heard folks say that to them. Matter of fact, people have offered that to me throughout my life in a way to compliment me. Joy, you know what? I don't even notice that you're black. And I'm going, well, that's interesting, because I do. <laughs> I wake up every morning, and sure enough, there's a black woman staring back at me. <laughs> about, you know, what is it? And I'm, I'm really okay with you noticing that I'm black. So the, the first thing I, I have to acknowledge, particularly as a clinician, is number one, the statement isn't true. That's the number one thing. You're telling me an untruth, right? Because you only actually say that to people you notice. White people never say to other people, I don't notice that you're white. They say it to the people they notice. Right? So the whole premise is kind of twisted. You, you follow me? So the first thing I started to gather was the whole notion of what it was that caused people the intrinsic discomfort around the issue of race. And I thought it was, it was proper in this setting. Okay, see, this is kind of what happens to me. This is a, the humbling that I receive whenever I start a presentation. When you, everybody else's stuff worked, mine doesn't. That's okay, though. I'm all right with that. Look at that. Needed to just turn it on. Very good. <laughs> But you know, when we start looking at the issues around race, it, I've seen some people out there with gray hair, and under all this dye is a lot of gray hair, okay? So uh, I'm going to start off with this statement, because how many people out there remember, uh, what is the greatest story ever told, Moses, you know, Charlton Heston? Y'all remember that? Okay, I'm going to read this. I have a friend who's Jewish. His name is J.I. Rakluski. Now, Jay and I have been friends for a long, long time, tw over 20 years. We, we've really been, you know, go to movies, we're cl close. And somehow in that 20 years, we, we never tended to discuss the fact that Moses' wife was black. L let me just read it for you. This is in Numbers 12, and it's fitting in this building. <laughs> because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. So in other words, what happened with this, Aaron and Miriam didn't like Moses' black wife. And God got a little upset about that and smite her with leprosy. <laughs> you know, because God don't like ugly, right? So we have had this little problem with race a long time. So when I talked to Jay, I said, Jay, I'm just confused all these years we've talked, and you never mentioned Moses' black wife. <laughs> I said, we could be cousins. about that is that, you know, as I, as I began to look at my, my investigation into trauma, historical trauma, and multi-generational trauma, which is what my work is about, I never felt the visceral pushback when people say Holocaust. Now, you can say slavery, you get one response, but you can say Holocaust, you get another. Because here's the reality, Jewish people honor their Holocaust. Jewish people don't care what you might think about their Holocaust, but their children are going to know, and their children are going to know. And if anyone gets confused, Spielberg will make another movie. <laughs> are you following me? But when you say, matter of fact, Spielberg got in trouble for the color purple, right? 
There have been a lot of pushback around issues of slavery. How dare you mention that, you know? And so what I began to look at is the pathology around race, hence I don't even notice race. When people say that, it's the symptom of a larger problem, the visceral response. And that's, as a social scientist and a clinician, I became interested in. I'm gonna pause, because I know I talk too fast. Okay, so, I want you to understand that throughout this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about something called cognitive dissonance. Say that with me, cognitive dissonance. How many of you know what that is? Show of hands. Those of you that don't, it's actually what it sounds like, cognitive thinking dissonance discord, thinking discord. I wondered first, how was it that Europeans who deemed themselves superior, noble, intelligent, civilized, moral, how did those same people engage in behaviors that were barbaric? The antithesis of all of what I just said. How did they reconcile that? And so, as I looked at this, I began to, to learn a little bit about how we remove dissonance. Because in order for you to function as a healthy human being, you cannot function with dissonance, conflicting ideas in one person. Hence, lie detector tests. A lie detector test assumes that you're gonna have a little problem with lying. So much so that it'll register on a machine. And unless you're a sociopath, that's usually what happens. So if a lie will register on a machine, how much more when you oppress an entire group of people for 246 years, officially, unofficially much longer than that? So if we look at American chattel slavery with, you know, 1619 to the ratification of the 13th Amendment and all of that, we're talking about 246 years. So how do you reconcile that? In other words, how do you remove the dissonance associated with that behavior? Because remember, you have to remove the dissonance in order to function. So here's a recipe, write it down, it's true of any group that you oppress or subjugate. You must first remove the dissonance, the discomfort related to that. So let's move through. You know, I really do believe that, and it, it was really alluded to consistently in the, in the presentation, that I believe that one of the most important things that we have to regain is our sense of humanity. And that is probably the most important movement or development in this century, is to develop our humanity. I love this statement because this statement is, is, is so powerful. It says, a human being is a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself as thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical illusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. Nobody is able to achieve this completely, but the striving for such achievement is in itself a part of the liberation and foundation for inner security. And this is a statement written by Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein believed in the intrinsic connectedness of all things, and that part of our problem was living an illusion of disconnect. And I believe that's true. And part of my moral footing, part of my values, suggests that truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtue. America's pathology is our denial. It is what keeps us sick around the issue of race. When I was doing clinical work and therapy, the only rule I had, and I worked with every walk of life imaginable, all the people nobody wants to work with, I worked with for 25 years. And my only rule to any people that stood in front of me was tell me the truth. Because if you cannot tell me the truth, then we cannot trust each other. And if we cannot trust each other, then we cannot have a relationship. And if we don't have a relationship, we have nothing. My only rule, tell the truth. And we need to tell the children the truth in particular. 
So on, the first thing we have to look at in terms of the truth is understanding that the majority of the world is a world of color. The notion of minority, I don't even, it's just nuts. Because the reality is, the majority of the world is a world of color. The problem is we're beginning to see that and that's getting people all twisted. <laughs> so who are we? I love this statement. It says your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, your values become your destiny. So what we value, and Gandhi said that, what we value becomes what we reflect. So when we start looking at cognitive dissonance, we have cognitive dissonance around our values. The first thing you must do to remove cognitive dissonance is you must justify your behavior. That's number one. And the second thing you must do once you have justified your behavior is you have to relabel the people you are oppressing in a way that justifies your behavior towards them. Are you following me? In order to remove cognitive dissonance, here's the recipe. You must first justify your behavior. You do so by relabeling the people to fit your behavior towards them. I'm not going to read this whole statement, but this is uh, basically written by a psychiatrist, Dr. Gilligan, James Gilligan, who basically said that the, the dying of one's culture, the removal of one's culture, is tantamount to the death of the self. This man did 25 years of work in prisons with some of the most violent offenders, most of whom were black and brown. And at the end of that 25 years, his assessment was, it wasn't that they were violent intrinsically, it wasn't that they were even horrible people, it was that they had been stripped of who they were. Something that he began to battle against in the middle of his life, he just, he stopped all that he was doing and began to launch a campaign against the assault on culture. So again, a lot of people have an interesting concept of racism. Racism is also a word that everybody gets all twisted about. And I, and I, and I teach a course, like I said, on, a grad, to graduate students on post-traumatic slave syndrome. Now let me explain something. I don't do race relations 101. I don't have time. Now I understand that there may even be people in this room that went, this is an interesting event. I'm going to go to that and support it. Yes, I am, and I, I'm going to sit and learn, but they have no idea that what they're getting ready to get here. And they may even stop and think to themselves, is it really that bad still? You think? Maybe you people are just overreacting, and you may be a little too sensitive. I don't work with them. <laughs> they, you can stay in the room, but this is a 600 level course. And people of color that walked into this room walked in at the 600 level, having lived in their skin. So I'm not dealing with the person who's going, do you think? I don't have time. Because there's too many people hemorrhaging for me to, to, to even begin to do that. So before I even teach my course, I send, uh, and let me introduce my daughter who's in the audience, who Joy, uh, Joy's daughter here is uh, Bahia Overton. Could you please stand Bahia? She's a ABD, working on her PhD, very proud of her. Anyway, she's one of my graduate assistants. <laughs> and before I actually teach my course on post-traumatic, I have my daughter go in and introduce this concept first, just so we can weed out the one-on-ones. Because I'm not gonna, you know, the tears, whatever, I can't, no, no, I can't do it. Won't do it, okay? So what ends up happening is I give them the example. I ask them what they understand about race. Now we can see, see it kind of rolls off the tongue. Racism is a system of advantage based on race. Can you see this well though, by the way? Can you see this? Okay, good. So it's a, it's a system of advantage based on race. Rolls off the tongue, pretty straightforward. But people think everybody's on the same page about that. I have never been in the audience, in an audience where people really get that. Ever, no matter how well educated folks are. So. Ask, have, have her ask a fundamental question. Do you think people in this audience, do you think you have a grasp on, well, let me just say, do you believe that there's something called white racism or white racism? Show of hands. White racism. Now, I want y'all to all turn around. Don't be afraid. There's not going to be no test at the end. How many people believe there's something called white racism? Show of hands. Now, look around the room so everybody can see, and you got folks kind of going. <laughs> Okay. All right. Another question. 
How many people in the room believe there's something called black racism? Show of hands. Okay, look around the room. I want y'all to look around. Okay, so now, we're, but now, see what I'm saying? We have a fun of it. What the heck? Wait, is this a trick? What's she doing? Okay, so. Not a trick. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, so the first column, we're going to talk about white racism because you're going to define it and assess this for yourself. This is why I have my daughter go in. So, white racism, we're going to define that first. I need for you to tell me how white racism adversely impacts the lives of black people as an entire group of people. I'm going to say that again. How is it that white racism adversely impacts the lives of black people in America as an entire group? In what ways? Tell me. Wealth. Wealth. Economics. Health care. Education. Education. Privilege. Privilege. Criminal justice. Okay. Are you, are you get, you're kind of getting it? Okay, good. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, and we can go on. We're going to talk about black racism. I need you to tell me, listen carefully, how black racism adversely impacts the lives of white people in America as an entire group of people. You see the difference? You've answered your question. There is something called black people hating. They can call your names. I hate you, hate you, hate you. I hate you. Jump up and, matter of fact, let's get all 12% of the black folk. Get, I think they say there's 13% of us now. Let's get all 13% of us hating white people. You still get the loan. You still get the house. You still get, are you following me? So you might have black people that hate white people. You may have black people that maybe affect a white person. But racism not only implies I don't like it, but I have the power to impact you as an entire group. That's the difference. Now at this point, I have folks going, what is she trying to say? I'm just telling you what it is. It's not personal, but it is true, okay? So we have to get, and usually by the next class, we know who's gonna stay in the class, see what I'm saying? <laughs> so the very first fundamental contradiction that occurred was the Constitution itself, was a whole notion of freedom and democracy that at the same time coexisted with the genocide of Native Americans, people, you know, Indian people, and the enslavement of African people. I mean, there seems to be a glaring contradiction going on there. So it created cognitive. So we have to remove the dissonance, and we do so. I have it right there. You have to justify your behavior by relabeling the people to fit your behavior toward them, because we can't have people feeling uncomfortable about this. We have to have everyone be okay about it. So somehow we have to make the notion of slavery reasonable and justified. And here are the institutions that were complicit, that had to be a part of, to participate in removing the dissonance. Are you hearing me? This was very, 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 very clear. And what I'm gonna share with you is neither obscure or particularly provocative. It's just been left out. What I'm gonna share with you is not you know, something we don't know, it just got taken out of the books. Because if it were left in the books, little Timmy and them would be feeling a little uncomfortable. Okay, let's start here. My daughter's telling me to keep it moving. Okay. How many of you have been to the Statue of Liberty? Show of hands, okay. I, I went to the Statue of Liberty twice because I knew the first time it was gonna make me mad. So I had to go back, because I'd already been to France and I'd seen different renderings. This picture is actually inside the Statue of Liberty in the basement, behind a case full of statues, encased in glass behind a wall. Now, most of you never saw this picture, but I was looking for it because I knew it was there, because I'd been to France and I'd seen this rendering. Now, what she's holding in her left hand are broken chains. Bartholdi, who was the artist, who in 1865, along with philanthropists and others, commissioned to have this thing done in the first place. 1865 was when they decided we're gonna send, create this thing and send it over to the United States. 1865, which was 
the end of civil war and also the end of chattel slavery. Now I say chattel slavery, very important too. And so what happened was when I went on the tour, see I knew about the change because Bartholdi insisted that the change remain. He insisted as an artist. And so when I came in, you know, and you have, if you got off the ferries, these are thousands of people every 20 minutes coming off the ferry. Thousands of children and schools and people from other countries and looky-loos, everybody showing up. Right? Thousands of people. So I'm one of those thousands getting off the ferry. And so we have our ranger who's basically going to walk you through the whole thing. So he got to the point where he says, and if there are any questions, <laughs> Hand went up and I go, yeah, I was curious about the chains. And all the people in my little group were going, chains? She's going, about chains? Chains? He goes, um, yeah, thank you for asking. We'll get to that. So, you know, you go on the tour and they dissect the whole thing. They show you how thick it is. It's the width of a penny. It's copper. That's why it turned green. They have a thing over here with the torch and they don't know if those are the, on her head is a crown or lights. And then they have a picture of you know, the whole thing with the legs over here. I mean, the whole thing is, you know, so you go through. And I'm just waiting to ask my question for him to answer the question about the chain. So we finally come to this garden where there are all of these bronze statues. Now, how many of you knew about the change, number one? Show of hands. How many of you, well, if you didn't know they were about the change, then you definitely don't know the answer to this one. How many of you were aware that the chains remained? Now, see, that's what's interesting, because there they are. They're at her feet. Now, the reason why Bartholdi insisted, he eventually won the argument, because the United States didn't want the chains shown. Bartholdi insisted that they remain, but look at where we put them. We put them where you can't see them. Now, why, Dr. DeGruy, is this important? Well, I'm an educator, and I'm a healer. So let me explain to you what happens when the little children from elementary, middle, high school, even college students get off the ferry, and they see the Statue of Liberty, and they go, you know, my great-great-grandmother, my great-great came through Ellis Island, my great-great, and little black children are looking on curiously. They look on curiously. You see, they didn't come through Ellis Island. But how much taller would they stand if they knew that Lady Liberty was trampling on the chains their ancestors came in the belly of ships chained together? That she was stepping on those chains. How much taller could they stand? How much connection could they feel if they just knew? But they don't know just like you don't know. And the reason you don't know is it would cause cognitive. And we can't have little Timmy and Susie and, and Becky hear it because then you'd have to explain those chains, would you not? And we don't want the visitors and people to deal with that little awful business of the slaves. I actually took this picture and it's kind of hard to see, but that little lip right there, the little tiny bump, is all the human eye can see no matter where you are on that tour. Now here's the thing, why isn't this little picture right there on display somewhere? That's not at the Statue of Liberty, by the way, that picture. It's not there, anywhere. Anywhere on the tour can you see the change? Nowhere. So I, you know, News at 11, I'm at the Ranger Station, I, ended up, by the way, ended up training, because my friend works for the Department of Interior, I ended up training all the rangers who didn't know the chains were there. That one ranger knew, remember I told you I went a second time? I went a second time to see if unasked, unprompted, it would be shown. And it was just that particular ranger that happened to have the picture. No one else knew. So I'm wondering about how is it that there isn't a picture of it anywhere? I could even call some folks I know in New York that are sculptors that could create a little, because they have every part of the statue dissected, but not that part. Anywhere on the tour. Cape Coast Slave Castle, how many of you have been there? Ghana. Went to Ghana, I decided I needed to go. I also found out we did the swab, which by the way I believe the swab to find out my DNA to see if mine. I think the United States should offer as reparations. Every black person should get the opportunity to know that because we were robbed of that. So that's to certainly be a part of it. But I found out that in fact my family did uh, come from the west coast of Africa. But we didn't just show up there, we actually had a trail of tears. 
of our own. Because you know, people would march from the interiors of Africa. And the, the, the belief now, based on historians, there are millions died on the way, fought back, got sick, children too weak, old people infirm, who died en route to the castles. When you walk in, there's two sides, there's a female male dungeon, and they usually rape the women within 50 feet of the men immediately to let them know that he can't protect you and to emasculate him. This is a male slave dungeon. Um, and the first thing you feel when you're in there is it's, it's horrific, it's pretty, it smells, that's number one. Uh, there's no running water, um, no lights, no facilities, and, and the floor is slippery. You're sliding, constantly sliding, and it's damp, and there are you know, roaches and bugs everywhere. That's the first thing that hits you. This is what it looks like when they turned off the light, and they warn you they're gonna turn off the light. Only source of light and ventilation. You know, these are people packed together, huddled together there. This is a death cell, because you have to wonder about what happened to the folks say, I'm not going out like that. Well, they put them in this cell, and uh, the big square you see there is not a window for this cell, but what, that little, there are little holes in the door, you can't see them, that was the only source. They stop feeding you and giving you water, so you know when you go in here, you're not coming out. And they were made examples, they literally would thirst and suffocate to death, kind of an agonizing law. Uh, long death. Next to that um, is a cell where white soldiers were held for 24 hours. That big square window is their window, and there's another one like it on the other side. As far as I can see, they could crawl out at night if they wanted to. Um, but really showing you the glaring difference. This is where I had a bit of a meltdown. Um, these are stairs leading to the governor's bedroom. This is directly to the female slave dungeon. And he, he had this built so that he could have access, the governor. And when the females fought back, they also had a death cell for women, which was more like a hole. But others they would put in the courtyard, chain them to this naked uh, until they died. And they stopped giving them water and food as an example to frighten the other women. Um, this is, was particularly uh, alarming. Uh, UNESCO, that's the United Nations Educational and Scientific Organization, he actually made these, these castles tourable. And what you see, it looks like a little watermark. You see the difference in color. And what, what they couldn't figure out is why they couldn't get the ground leveled. And they realized that they were trying to break through two feet of solidified human waste. So there's two things you have to know about that. People wallowed in two feet of solidified human waste. And they never bothered to remove it. Hence, it was solidified. And in the middle of all of it is, of course, the church where they sang hymns and said prayers and made everyone Christian. How many of you knew that the United States recently apologized for slavery? Did you know that? Interesting, um, that's a pretty major event, but you didn't hear much about it. Where was, you know, the big, you know, CNN, commemorations, day of, you know, Nothing. And then I wondered, this, they apologized twice, 2008 and 2009. House of Representatives, right, and the state and the Senate. Both apologized to, and I thought, why 2008? Did they just remember? I mean, didn't they know? And the interesting thing about this is because in 2007, I was touring Europe because I do work in London. And um, they were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the end of the slave trade in England. Entire country, Google, entire country was commemorating the end of the slave trade in Europe in 2007. What was the bicentenary or the 200th anniversary in America? That would be 2008. We had to do something. But look at what it says, all you whining and complaining black people. It acknowledged the injustice, cruelty, brutality, and inhumanity of slavery and Jim Crow. The resolution states that the vestiges of Jim Crow continue to this day. African Americans continue to suffer from the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow long after both systems were formally abolished through enormous damage and loss, both tangible and intangible, including the loss of human dignity and liberty, the frustration of careers and professional lives, and the long-term loss of income and opportunity. They knew and have always known. But whenever anyone black mentions it, oh, come on, you know, you're free now. <clears throat> the playing field's been leveled for you people. And so even black people shudder when you say the word slave. 
because they don't want to be appearing like, you know, well, the whiners. We also know that it's a crime based on the International Tribunal. It's a, it's a crime against humanity, punishable by death. Interesting. Slavery is listed. But somehow America escaped that. So let's look at the role of these various uh, components. This is Carl von Linnaeus. Now, I just want to say, it's just my personal opinion. You should always get concerned when you see folks dressed like this. <laughs> just, my, just something that I, I, I just I, I. Now, actually, all of you know Carl. Anyone that went to high school, you had to deal with Carl. Carl von Linnaeus developed a taxonomic system based on a criterion of skin color and laid the basis for 19th century racial classification. He, he's basically known for classifying stuff, phylum, genus, species. He just classified everything. He also classified human beings. Note the date, 1707 to 1778. Now, what is going on in America at that time is American chattel slavery. Now, let's just get up close and personal with that because there's some people, these are the other folks that are going, well, you know, slavery's not a new institution. Slavery's always existed and all societies have had some form of slavery. But there is nothing like American chattel slavery. Because you see, in the past, most people who became slaves became so as a result of war. Two societies went to war, winners and slavery losers. Sometimes you would have, in a case like Rome, you'd have a more dominant you know, country or place or you know, make war and take the manpower. But Europeans systematically turned the capturing, shipping, and selling of other human beings into a business a business that would develop into the backbone of an entire economy. That's different. It differed in the manner in which a person became enslaved. It differed in the length of servitude. It differed in the treatment of enslaved people. And it differed, listen carefully, most of all, the way that they were viewed, which were subhuman, which means you will never rise to the level of human, which means that you will forever be a slave. Well, let's see how we justify this to remove the cognitive. Now, science becomes important because, you know, whenever people want to, you know, prove their point, they go, you know, it's scientific what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is a scientific fact, okay, which means that it trumps whatever fact you have because it's a scientific fact. Anybody notice we lost a planet recently? Now, some people are old enough to remember the little styrofoam balls that we used to use with the little planets, you know. <laughs> you know, one of them's gone. I'm mad about that. <laughs> that one of the little balls gone. <laughs> and see, that's a whole damn it planet. Let's keep it real. How you lose a planet? <laughs> that's a big mistake, you think? <laughs> but, you know, you notice how there was, it just kind of went on without a ripple. They just ripped the ball off and kept it moving. And science never said anything about it except we've had a paradigm shift. Here's the answer, you was wrong. <laughs> that was what that was, wasn't never a planet there. <laughs> anyway, I digress. <laughs> Although color classifications of races dated back to the ancient Egyptians, anthropologists refer to Linnaeus' taxonomy, now he's the father of anthropology here, uh, of 1735, as the modern, first modern study of man. And while Linnaeus advanced classification with his use of a color criterion, he also fixed on his four families of man certain moral and intellectual peculiarities. That continued into the 19th century anthropological vocabulary. He described Homo Americanus. Who might that be? That would be natives. And let's see what he says about them. He says they are reddish, choleric, obstinate, contented, and regulated by customs. No science yet. Homo europaeus, that would be white people, he says they are white, fickle, sanguine, blue-eyed, gentle, and governed by laws. Still no science. Homo asiaticus, that would be Asians, he says they are sallow, grave, dignified, avaricious, and ruled by opinions. And Homo afer, black, phlegmatic, cunning, lazy, lustful, careless, and governed by caprice. These insights into what Linnaeus defined as racial character, personality traits, behavior, intelligence, language, 
and a host of other related categories were transmitted into subsequent attempts at a science of classification and became more fixed than the races themselves. Not a shred of science here. But it is in a book. And presumably if it's in a book, then it must be true. And look at how he's dressed. <laughs> so here's the thing. There's only one group that really receives scathing attributions. All of them. All of them are scathing. So now remember, let's see if you're paying attention. In order to remove the dissonance, what must you do? You have to justify your behavior. How do you do so? By relabeling the people to fit your behavior towards them. Don't they deserve to be enslaved? I just told you that they're phlegmatic, cunning, lazy, lustful, careless, and governed by caprice. Don't they deserve to be slaved? And I've told you this is scientifically what they are. And then my students in 2011 say, well, Dr. Joy, wait, we're talking 1707. I said, but do you not still hear these attributions? Do you not still hear them today? So much so that my mother, bless her heart, passed away. My mother, the dad died far too soon as well. But my mother taught me in such a way that it wasn't until recently that I was able to leave a hotel room dirty enough for any maid to have to clean it. Because my mother taught me, always leave it cleaner than you found it. Because my mother was running from the shame, you see. My mother was running from what will they think about us, the black people, if we leave the room dirty. Are you hearing me? So let's look at his vita. Apparently no one else did. Linnaeus, the formal education of this great Swedish scientist, after one week, received his PhD for a 13-page dissertation from the Dutch University of Hardwick, which one historian of science designated as a mail order institution. The University of Hardwick was, was known for selling degrees. A saying in the Netherlands for a person whose scientific knowledge is questionable is, he's from the University of Hardwick. <laughs> okay, now this is Johan. Look at him. <laughs> Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, he becomes another very important, important person. He was a professor at Göttingen that designated five races or varieties of man in the second edition of his work on the natural variety of mankind. His division into Caucasian, Mongolian, American, Ethiopian, and Malayan races with the added Carl von Linnaeus descriptive peculiarities became the subsequent basis of most 19th century anthropomedical studies. While Linnaeus founded his system, remember, principally upon skin color, Blumenbach considered a combination of color, hair, skull, and facial characteristics as fundamental means for classifying what he believed to be the five varieties of man. Central to his study, was the term Caucasian, which he originated. He took the name Caucasian, listen for the science, from Mount Caucasus because its southern slope had cradled what he felt to be the most beautiful race of men, the Georgian, the Caucasus near Mount Ararat, upon which the biblical ark came to rest after the flood, seemed the appropriate source for the original race of men. Now I'm quoting him here. And he says, and I quote, for in the first place, the stock displays as we've seen the most beautiful form of the skull, from which a, as a mean and primeval type, the others diverge by most easy gradations on both sides to the two ultimate extremes, that is on the one side the Mongolian and on the other the Ethiopian. Besides, it is white in color. Anybody out there ever met a skull that wasn't? <laughs> All righty then which we may fairly assume to have been the primitive color of mankind. zippity doo da, no science here. <laughs> Let's look at his education. This might explain it. Blumenbach received his medical degree from the University at Göttingen after submitting his 15-page long dissertation, the result of one year study with an older professor who owned an extraordinarily large and disordered natural history collection. Blumenbach, along with scientific races of Britain and the United States, began to rank facial characteristics and skin color hierarchically. 
beginning not surprisingly with white is superior and most beautiful, thus identifying beauty as a scientific category. What we have to understand here, and you know, I'm not going to read this. I highly recommend that you read this book, though, which is called The History of White People by Nell Painter. The whole notion of whiteness did not exist in antiquity. Nobody referred to themselves as white in antiquity. Whiteness is a new phenomenon, because there was a point when Irish weren't white. You know that, right? Irish was right along there with all the rest of the subhumans until the invention of white supremacy and the concept of whiteness, which came much later, has nothing to do with the history of white people as it relates to antiquity. So, here's what we now know because we have, you know, CSI. <laughs> Based on mitochondrial DNA, we now know that race is a concept of society that insists there is a genetic significance behind human variations in skin color that transcends outward appearance. However, race has no scientific merit outside of sociological classifications. There are no significant genetic variations within the human species to justify the division of races. Mankind is one. And we have always been one. Which begs the question of why the bell curve came up yet again. It begs the question why we consistently deal with notions of inferiority and superiority because we're trying to remove the cognitive dissonance. Okay, so let's see what politics said. Okay, well again, look how he's dressed. So here's what we realize. This is James Madison. Now this becomes critical because of who he is, right? Now we know about the three-fifths compromise. How many of you know about that? Three-fifths compromise. Okay, well we don't have to go over that. We know that it was all political. It was about power and money. And we know that the South wanted to keep slavery at the Constitutional Convention of 1787, they wanted to, or 1778, they wanted to maintain slavery south, the north wanted to abolish it, everyone agreed to abolish it. Everyone did except one state, South Carolina. So they stalemated, decided to table the discussion, slavery continued to be legal. Well, how are we gonna count the slaves? Because you know the more people residing in a state, the more representatives you can send to the House of Representatives and the more power. So of course, Southerners want to count the slaves. Northerners say, you can't count the slaves, you say they're not human. Agreed upon solution, three-fifths compromise. Rather than each slave being counted, three-fifths of the entire population, hence we became divested of two-fifths of the man. But you don't even know you're talking about a human being here. Look at how it rolls off the tongue. Blacks are inhabitants, but it's debased by servitude below the equal level of free inhabitants, which regards the slaves as divested of two-fifths. Are we talking about a human? Is there a warm body in there somewhere? No, but we had to remove the what? So language also helped us to, okay, and so then we have my favorite person, Thomas Jefferson. You know, you all remember the big, you know, scandal. Folks started clutching the pearls. Oh my God, not Thomas, not, not our Thomas. <laughs> yeah. See, everybody black knew about Sally Hemings already. We all knew, As a matter of fact, I have some cousins in Louisiana, <coughs> We call him out, you know, the matter of fact, he's an anchor, don't tell him. His name is Pierre de Gru. He's my cousin, but we, we never get, get invited to the family gatherings because Pierre doesn't know about us, but we know about him. <laughs> and so there, there's this whole notion of, you know, the mixing and people, you know, concerned. But let's look at what Thomas Jefferson, he becomes an important person too, right? Because if he said it, that's Thomas Jefferson, it must be what? True! Thomas Jefferson wouldn't lie to us. He's the father of our country. He really is the father of our country. Okay. So let's, I'm just saying, you know. So let's see what he said. He said blacks smelled bad and were physically unattractive. A little inconsistent with his behavior, isn't it? Now here's one that was really even more interesting. He said we required less sleep. See, that's an interesting one there. Because you see, what he's trying to remove is his own cognitive dissonance, yes? And in so doing, he removes everyone else's dissonance because, well, he's Thomas Jefferson. So he said we required less sleep. What dissonance was he experiencing that he would need to say that? How long was the work day for an enslaved African? Anybody ponder a guess? You know, when you clock in and clock out? See, black people call it KC to KC, right? Sunrise to sunset. That's how hard we work. And then there are always white people who feel 
the dissonance and need to back up people. They go, well, do you have any empirical evidence to suggest they didn't have anything? They may have just worked an eight-hour day with, with breaks and lunch. How do you know? Well, we actually do know because we have forensics now. And our ancestors unearthed themselves of all places on Wall Street. Most people don't associate slavery with New York or the North. The truth is all 13 colonies had slavery with estimates of 10 to 20,000 people buried in this seven acre burial ground. It's considered the largest known site of its kind in the US. Blakey's analysis of human skeletal remains revealed that these men and women were literally worked to death. How do you know? They suffered from enthesopathies, a condition resulting in the muscle detaching itself from the bone as a result of people being worked beyond human capacity. That's how hard we work, you lazy people, you. Isn't it, remember, Linnaeus said we were lazy, didn't he? He said scientifically we were lazy, and we were literally worked to death. But Thomas Jefferson couldn't have folks knowing that, so he just simply asserted, well, you know, they just require less sleep. Then he says something even more difficult and to even wrap your head around. He says, we were incapable of feeling grief. Why would Thomas Jefferson need to believe such a thing? What was he doing that he needed to rest and wrap himself in that lie? He was selling mothers away from their infants, away from husbands away from wives, brothers away from sisters. Surely they cannot feel grief. That would make them human, like me. So he simply asserted it's not true. Now I close out my book with a soliloquy from Thomas Jefferson. He says, indeed I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Those are his words, he knew. He knew very clearly what it would produce. The assault and the trauma to the descendants of enslaved Africans and to the unearned privilege of the whites and their progeny. <clears throat> so just to kind of give you an idea of how you dehumanize a person in just a flash, you barely know, again, you're talking about anyone human. This is why he had to assert that we could not feel grief. Valuable Negro woman accustomed to all kinds of housework, good plain cook, excellent dairy maid, washes and irons, has four children, one, a girl, 13 years of age, another seven, a boy, about five, an infant, 11 months old. Two of the children will be sold with the mother, the other separately, if it best suits the purchase. I want you to imagine that being your family today. And someone coming and saying, yeah, well, you're, yeah, well, you know, we can sell them as a package, but if you don't want them all, we'll, we, we'll just sell them separately. It's, it's, you can't even wrap your head around it. Again, send us your poor, your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And there's a reason why we can do this, because we can't feel it. Well, what role did religion play? We know they were there from the gate. Y'all don't know Richard. Richard was an absentee owner. He was the son of a Presbyterian minister, international trader of enslaved Africans, amassed a massive fortune back in the 1700s worth 68 million today, never left home. But he owned the enslaved Africans, he owned the sugarcane plantations, he owned the ships, but he never got his hands dirty because he never left home. But this guy you do know. You know the Reverend John Newton. I can guarantee you you know him. I want you to, and again, the Reverend John Newton, I had to study him because, I, again, I'm on the international uh, faculty of the, the Department of Health in London, so I had to study British history and understand the impact of enslaved uh, uh, Africans there. And listen, look at what he said. He said, slaves are lesser creatures without Christian souls and thus are not destined for the next world. Now this is a minister saying this, but what you have to understand is why he said it, because he was experiencing cognitive, now let's see why he was experiencing dissonance. When the women and girls are taken on board a ship naked, trembling, and terrified, they are often exposed to the wanton rudeness of white savages. The prey is divided upon the spot. Resistance or refusal would be utterly in vain. I sin with a high hand. And then he discovered something that everybody sings about. 
amazing grace. Now see, I read about him. It took him a long time to find that amazing grace. But until he did find the amazing grace, he had to, of course, dehumanize the young women and girls he was raping. He said, well, you know, they don't have souls anyway because he needed to feel no dissonance for ravaging these, these, these frightened, tormented girls. So he just asserted, well, they don't have souls, so I'm okay to rape them. And then, of course, his dissonance got to him, and he finally found amazing grace. Well, let me explain to you post-traumatic slave syndrome. I don't think there's anyone in the United States that sings amazing grace more than black people. Am I telling the truth? This Sunday, somewhere in a black church, Sister Jones <laughs> gonna sing the solo. Stay with me, because there's one line of that I don't understand how any black person can allow move through their lips. That saved a wretch like me. He should be saying it, because he's the wretch. Are you following me? But now we, black people, call ourselves the wretch when they were raping our ancestors and beating and selling them. And now we call ourselves the wretch because we don't know who we are, because we don't know this history, because it somehow escaped the textbook. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. Education. Well, y'all know Aristotle. Aristotle said that some are destined to be slaves and some are destined to be rulers. That it is an act of nature and that by a peculiar act of God, black people were peculiarly fit for a laborious class permanently. Well, Aristotle was smart. So it must be true. You see, everyone was complicit. How many of you knew that they put a black man in the Bronx Zoo? in a monkey cage. But that wasn't during slavery, look at the date, that's 1906, y'all free. Aren't you free? Isn't the, wait a minute, isn't the playing field leveled now for you people? They put a black man in the Bronx Zoo, his name is Bingo, he shot himself in the head eventually. But let's see what the New York Times had to say about that, because you know, they defended it. We do not quite understand all the emotion which others are expressing in the matter. It is absurd to make moan over the imagined humiliation and degradation Binga is suffering. The pygmies are very low in the human scale. And the suggestion that Binga should be in a school instead of a cage ignores the high probability that school would be a place from which he could draw no advantage whatever. The idea that men are all much alike except as they have had or lacked opportunities for getting an education out of books is now far out of date. So they said he belonged in that cage. And good folks, Christians, women, children, went to the zoo and watched a man who was in a cage in 1906. And then we wondered why folks got a little upset with this photo. That would be LeBron James. Now, if I were to ask you, <clears throat> look at just LeBron, the LeBron James side of it. Uh, this is the first black man ever to appear in 2008 on the cover of Vogue magazine, first in history. Now, if you were to just see that picture, is it, does it remind you of a movie? Just the picture of LeBron. What movie does that remind you of? King Kong. King Kong, very clearly, an ape, you see. Vogue said, Oh my goodness, that was, that was a coincidence. <laughs> they got it down to the blue dress, are you hearing me? But Vogue said, oh no, it was a coincidence. And I might have believed Vogue if I didn't know that. But you see, we don't know who we are because if LeBron James had received the education about who he was, he would have never taken that picture. Never. But we don't know who we are and that's deliberate because if we knew who we are, we would experience cognitive dissonance. Okay, it gets a little dicey now, I just want you to know. These pictures aren't in my book, but I have them here for a reason, because there's people in here I want you to see. Now, I'm not showing you this picture to make you feel all icky inside because of the man who's lynched there, who, bless his soul, is still intact with his dignity. But I want you to see who's in this picture. And I want you to see what they're wearing. They're wearing what color? 
So what day is it? So where have they been? And then they went to the... Now I want you to see how, look at the little one back there, little bitty one in the back. See the little one, way the little one back there. And no one's looking horrifically. Let me put this in perspective for you. If I were to take a puppy, you know the happy puppy everyone loves, the lab. So we get the little yellow lab, because everybody who's nice has little yellow labs. So the lab, we got the yellow lab puppy running around. And I grab the little puppy right here in front of you all take some of these wires and wrap it around the puppy's neck and hold it up in front of you today until that puppy gasped and died, you would be traumatized and I would be arrested faster than if there was a black man on the other side. You would be traumatized so much so some of you would run out of the room screaming, some of you would attack me, some of you would need therapy. How is it they're not even grimacing? Everyone asks me, what happened to white people, Joy? You talk about post-traumatic slave syndrome and the injury to black people. What happened to white people? That's what happened to white people. Can't feel it. That subtle contempt, there it is. To can't figure out why I can't feel it. Centuries of saying they're not human says he's less than a deer. No tears for him. That's what happened to white people. And it messes with white people all the way up to Katrina. I'm going to take you there. Look at that one, plain old common folk, pushing to get in the photo. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Now what you were taught was, oh that's those toothless folks with hoods running around. Those few twisted white people who did that horrible stuff. These are plain old common folk. Thousands of people gathered at lynchings. And here's the big news, this wasn't during slavery, this was after slavery. Most lynchings occurred after, not during because you don't lend your property because their, their labor is lost to you, you see? But you weren't taught that and you weren't showing these pictures because it would create what? Let's put this picture in perspective. That, by the way, that picture and that one came from a, a book, if you want to see it, it's called Without Sanctuary. But what's even more horrific, when I first saw these pictures when I was doing the research, my kids would walk in and you know, I read this, this is a chapter in my book was most difficult to write because it hurt me. I was going, my God, where did these pictures come from? Surely, you know, did they find them in dusty basements? Did they find them in attics where someone had hidden them away? No, no, no. Nana, oh, you know, we're, we had the lynching on Saturday. You missed it, no problem. I'll send you a postcard. These are postcards. That's why we have them, which means they were sent through the what? Plain old common folks. See, but you missed that in your history, didn't you? Yeah, and you missed that these are the folks that attended. But let's see what they did at the lynching. This is taken from a book called A Hundred Years of Lynching, No Pictures. Before the torch was applied, the Negro was deprived of his ears, fingers, and genital parts of his body. And that's interesting, the fun function of, of the genitals. They always often castrated black men. Castrated them. And that was because of a preoccupation with the penis, which is really... True, there was a preoccupation with the penis. Even though in terms of rape, according to a mid-1800 census, there were over 600,000 mixed-race babies born. That was during miscegenation. Miscegenation is a law making it illegal to have sex or engage and cohabitate with anyone of another race. So there was a lot of folks like Jefferson sneaking out back, okay? but they would cut off the genitals of black men almost immediately. He pleaded pitifully for his life while the mutilation was going on, but stood the ordeal of fire with surprising fortitude. Before the body was cool, it was cut to pieces. The bones were crushed into small bits, and even the tree upon which the wretch met his fate was torn up and disposed of as souvenirs. The Negro's heart was cut into several pieces, as was also his liver. Those unable to obtain the ghastly relics direct paid their more fortunate possessors extravagant sums for them. Small pieces of bones went for 25 cents and a bit of the liver crisply cooked sold for 10 cents. As soon as the Negro was seen to be dead, there was a tremendous struggle among the crowd to secure the souvenirs. Dear, could you bring me an ear to put on the mantle? You see, it's, it's incredulous to you, isn't it? 
But read about Ida B. Wells. They ran train excursions, and they let children out of school early so they could attend. That one became very personal to me because I actually did training. Uh, and I had this picture for many years before I realized that um, I was actually doing a talk in the very place where these three uh, young men uh, were lynched in Minnesota. Now, here's the thing. What were they accused of? Raping a white girl. That's all you need, really, because remember, you know, Sa what's her name? Uh, Sally, was it Smith? Susan Smith. Remember Susan Smith? Because all you got to do is say it was a black man. Here is a woman, Susan Smith, certifiably insane, drowned her own children, put them in their little car seats, and pushed the car into the water. Made up two black men, said two black men came and took her children. Got a sketch artist, got national attention. Not only did she make it all up, but they created a sketch and found them. But that's how much power one white insane woman had. But that wasn't during slavery. Isn't the playing field level? Well, all they had to do was say this girl was raped. And she denied it, by the way. The girl, she denied it. And she had had intercourse, in fact, with her boyfriend, who had lost a bet with these three young men. But look at how close they're standing. And look at the smiles on their face. Plain old common folk. And see, people wonder, why can't I feel it? I'm not talking about intellectualizing it. I'm talking about empathizing. And see, that's a deep one. Get still about that one, because you don't even know why I can't feel it. Can't figure it out. That's how much it took. Well, here we go, slavery by another name. We're moving forward. I'm going to bring you up to 2011, and then I'm going to give you some specifics of what post-traumatic looks like. This is a sharecropper, and the sharecropper goes back to the plantation. Now, by the way, I know you all had the picture in your book, or the two pages you had, just tell me went along. Two pages of black history. One was a picture, a little chimney, folks eating watermelon, playing the banjo, right? Those were the two pictures. Well, these are actual leftover uh, slave quarters, and they were also very close to animal stables. That becomes very important for you. He goes back. Why do you go back? You can't read, you can't write. Why would you go back to the people who enslaved you? Well, because you better not come here. <laughs> so we thought we was free, but let's see what they said in Oregon, where I uh, work. No free Negro mulatto not residing in this state. I'm going to have to say this fast, by the way. I'm sorry. At the time of the adoption of this Constitution, shall come, reside, be within the state, hold any real estate, make any contracts, or maintain any suit therein, and the legislative assembly shall provide by penal laws for the removal by public officers of all such Negroes and mulattoes, and for their effectual exclusion from the state, and for the punishment of persons who shall bring them into the state or employ or harbor them. Look at when it was repealed, 1926. That wasn't during slavery, though, was it? But I thought you people were free. Couldn't we go north? Well, not here. So we had exclusionary acts, black, cold, sundown towns. And if you didn't leave, what are we going to do? That if any free Negro and mulatto shall fail to quit the country as re, uh, required by this act, if guilty upon trial, shall receive upon his or own, her back, not less, we'll beat you. But I thought we were free. I don't, I don't understand. Why can't you just pull yourselves up from your bootstraps? My father was alive in 1926. So he went back, couldn't read, couldn't write. So guess what he did? He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a fair wage. I'm going to advance you seeds, mule, tools. And at the end of the year, we'll settle up. What happened at the end of the year? Well, he was found owing. So what did he have to do? He had to work it off, which is another form of? But you're free. Come on now. If only you had you know, paid your debt. You all know about Peter. This picture is in my book. I'm glad I found out his name. Re recently I found out his name was Peter. He didn't have a name for a long time. What you see on his back are keloids, which is common with people with a great deal of melanin. So he was beaten rather severely, really severely. So when I saw this picture, I wondered about how often people got beaten to death. You think people got beaten to death back then? I thought, well, surely. I mean, he made it, but goodness. And I, and I did find out that there were people being beaten to death, so much so they created a law called the Casual Killing Act. And if any slave resists his master, owner, or other person by his or her order correcting such slavery shall happen to be killed 
in such correction. It shall not be counted felony, but the master owner and every other person so giving correction shall be acquit of all punishment and accusation for the same as if such accident had never happened. The casual killing act. And I thought, well, who's beat people to death so much that you have to create a killing act? That would be, hello, white women. Never snuck into your textbooks, but it was white women who were beating black children to death, because whose children were they really? We can't have Miss Ann suffering. Well, can't we lease them? We're moving on now, can we lease them? We realize we can't have con, we cannot, you know, have the black codes and the sundown, so can we lease them? Everyone wants to know where overrepresentation in the criminal justice system came from, from this institution. Big business then, big business now and everyone signs it off, modern day slavery. Modern day, always have to have a free labor force. They make, uh, they, they even uh, do a, a flight arrangements for people now out of prisons. Make uniforms for Burger King, high-end furniture. Then we got, oh goodness, separate but equal, the saints be praised. Still separate, aren't we? Have we ever been equal? Tell the truth. How many people been in the hood? There's no sign, though, on the freeway that says next right hood. But you always know when you're in the hood, don't you? Drive and, hey, yeah, whoa, we're in the hood. <laughs> we are in the hood. And you know when you've arrived in the hood because instead of banks, you see check cashing. <laughs> and then you see also liquor stores. And across the street from the liquor store is what? How come you know that? Isn't that interesting? But you see, we don't even own it because guess who owns the check cashing place? That would be banks. That's a choice. We don't own the ghetto, it was created for us. Separate but equal, oh, but she's whining, let's move on. This is a book called With Breaking Rank by Norm Stamper, 34 year police veteran, white man, went back, got his PhD, chief of police San Diego, chief of police in Seattle. Let's see what he says in 2005. I've heard some police officers refer to prostitute slayings or to the slayings of blacks as misdemeanor murders. Employing an unofficial code for them, it's just an NHI, no human involved. San Diego cops confessed to a myriad other acts of discrimination, including additional dehumanizing references to blacks on a radio call. This is a radio call. Oh, it's just an 1113 nigger, 1113 being a code for an injured animal, followed by a descriptor dog, cat, skunk. He went on to talk about the fact that there's a predatory group of police officers, 5% of any department, that's going to prey on women. He says, my cautious guess is that 5% of America's cops are on the prowl for women. In a department the size of Seattle's, that's 36, or 63, I'm sorry, police officers. In San Diego, 145. In New York, 2,000. The average patrol cops makes anywhere from 10 to 20 unsupervised contacts a shift. If he's on the make, chances are a predatory cop will find you, your wife, your partner, your daughter, your sister, your mother, your friend. It is not hard to understand why people of color, the poor, and younger Americans did not and do not look upon the police as theirs. Compare and contrast, are the police as an institution known for their protection of the innocent against deception? Or do they deceive the innocent? Do the police protect the weak against oppression or intimidation, or do they oppress and intimidate the very people that they were sworn to protect? And Matilda's mother knows, but that wasn't during slavery. <coughs> so when we look at Jim Crow, this is a book that came out in 2010 by Michelle Alexander. Tell me how to move it along. Look at her shaking her head, telling me how. Okay, I gotta read this. <laughs> I have to. In the era of colorblindness, it's no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination, exclusion, and social contempt, so we don't. Rather than rely on race, we use our criminal justice system to label people of color criminals and then engage in all the practices we supposedly left behind. Today, it is perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all the ways that it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. Once you're labeled a felon, the old forms of discrimination, denial of the right to vote, denial of educational opportunity, denial of food stamps and other public benefits and exclusion from jury service are suddenly legal. 
As a criminal, you have scarcely more rights, arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended racial caste in America, we have merely redesigned it. Well, maybe it's because they just do so much crime, these black people. These stark racial disparities cannot be explained by rates of drug crime. Studies show that people of all colors use and sell illegal drugs at remarkably similar rates. If there are significant differences in the surveys to be found, they frequently suggest that whites, particularly white youth, are more likely to engage in drug crime than people of color. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, so. <laughs> Hurricane Katrina. I remember this because my family's from Louisiana. My brother was missing for three days, so it got personal. And I remember all of the hoopla, interesting things that the social scientists recognized how people responded to this disaster. And of course it was horror. And I know people, black, white, every race, rolled up their sleeves and says, I'm ready to go. Hey, I got a boat. Hey, I've got resources. And they turned them around and said, no, no, it's too dangerous for you to come here. I know because I went to the ninth floor. I had family there. I knew. But they said it was too dangerous to help these people inside the United States. And where was Dr. Phil? And I wonder, where was the emotion? Because the first thing we did was we, we, we intellectualized it. We had people on talk shows going, well, you know, is it, do you think it's, they're saying it's racial. You think it's race? Or maybe it's class. Let's ask Condoleezza. Maybe she knows. <laughs> so then we, then after we intellectualized it, then we had to figure out who to get mad at. Stay with me, the two emotions. We intellectualize it, now we're getting angry. Who is it? Is that mayor? Who is it for? Let's smoke them out. But where was the empathy? <clears throat> where was the empathy? Not the anger, not the intellectual, the empathy. Because you see, I dealt with survivors. I dealt with, with children who said who, they couldn't get in the tub anymore because they were scared of water. Or why the survivors who came on the back of trucks with feces on them said, how could they go and rescue pets? and not rescue us. You know, believe it, go online. This is a movie called Dark Waters. It won awards because people rescued pets. Because white people were closer to their pets, you see. That's where the crocodile tears happened. But not for the black babies that were floating in the water. But let's see, is Joy being oversensitive? This is taken from Associated Press. Let's see what it says. Top photo is a black person in the water, and it reads, a young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on Tuesday, August 30th, 2005. The photo below is the precise same thing, except they're white people. Look how it reads. Two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. Do you see? And I don't know if the reporters realized that they were doing it, because they looked at that black person and they said, oh, they're looting. Black people loot. White people don't loot. Hell, white people stole us. <laughs> but you see, because that would produce what? Dissonance. So we, we, we immediately reframe it so everyone can feel good. And if you don't believe it, they blacked out Louisiana by telling you that they were rapists and looters, blacked it out, and you never asked another question. Because you see, they really deserved it. They weren't good people anyway. And then Barbara Bush said, why didn't they leave? They could have left. Do you see? Then we had the earthquake in, in Haiti. And you know, Haiti's been punished for a long time. And look what made national headlines. The deadly Haitian earthquake that killed thousands, it's God's vengeance. So you see, these Haitians, they deserve it too. But we didn't do that with tsunami victims. And we all know that that is the number one child pornography, human trafficking in the world. But that didn't creep up because somehow we could like them a little more. Gotta go fast, roll of medicine. She's shaking her head, no. Okay, I just have to say, I'm not gonna read it. J. Marion Sims, father of modern gynecology, matter of fact, it was covered in the presentation. He used to cut into black girls and women and said that their race made them durable so they didn't need anesthesia. He went on um, and fixed them because white slave owners says they weren't fit for duty because they had obstetric fistulas. This is when little girls have babies too early and they tear all the way down to the rectum and then they have a leakage of urine and feces. So he fixed them so that they would be more accessible sexually. 
And then they pathologize them. Again, they pathologize all black people because, of course, we all have congenital leprosy. That's why we're black. Because you have to justify your behavior, right? This is medicine. You have to justify what you're doing to these people. So the first thing they said was we're, we have abnormal skin. We have congenital leprosy. Everybody black in the room, that's the reason. You have black skin over normal white skin. This is in medical journals. But then the second pathology was, well, you have a big butt. That must be proof of our irreligious, lustful, and immoderate attitude, which means that, well, if they're that way, we can't rape them. Black females were incapable of being raped because medicine said that our protruding buttocks and genitals were evidence that we were basically immoral and irreligious. Anybody out there with a big butt that's black? Come on now, raise your hand if you have a big butt. <laughs> Anybody with a big butt? You tramps, you sluts, you whores. <laughs> But there's a statue of him in the middle of Central Park, all right, where we praise him for what he's done. That's the author of my Holocaust. And there's a, his duckbill speculum that he created out of a pewter spoon by experimenting on black women displayed at Ellis Island, where they asked me to, at this particular juncture, they asked me, and everyone, because you know, I had the audio tour, and when you get to this point where European women had to have examinations, they say, imagine. I need you to imagine what it felt like to be a European woman coming across this ocean to a place they were unfamiliar with. Frightened and concerned about what this land would be like, whether they could stay, whether their loved ones would be able to stay. Imagine what it must have felt like to be prodded and poked by strangers. Because you see, they wanted me to feel empathy for white women. And because I have my humanity, I could feel empathy for white women. But where was the empathy for black women? Anyway, where was someone saying, imagine what it felt like to be chained in the belly of a ship with 18 inches between you, where you slept, where you wept, where you ate, where you defecated, where you urinated, where you menstruated, where you vomited, where you gave birth and died with 18 inches of space? Where was someone saying, imagine where is it anywhere in this country? Anywhere. Where is the day, the moment, the second of silence that says, imagine the shoulders that I stand upon? Why is that OK? That I can't honor them anywhere in this country. But they ask me, imagine joy. And I can, and I'm angry that I have empathy for white women and the horrors of what it must have felt like to be prodded. But I have to imagine what it felt like to have someone cut into an 11 year old, cut into her to abuse her womb. And we're nowhere in this country, nowhere do we honor her. And that's so that Timmy and Cindy don't feel dissonance. They did it to Indian women too. Matter of fact, all women of color. Then basically, 19th century psychologists decided that there was one diagnosis for slaves, draped the mania, the uncontrollable urge to escape from slavery was that diagnosis. Because they had to, again, why would you want to leave slavery? Must be their problem. Oh yeah, they have draped the mania. Well, it doesn't surprise me that we have health disparities because black folks don't trust doctors and we got lots of reasons. Just read a medical apartheid by Harriet Washington. So let me just quickly end with a story and talk about post-traumatic slave syndrome and what it looks like now. <clears throat> See, what does, what does this have to do with contemporary folks, particularly African people, because you know, I've endeavored to heal uh, people. First of all, let's understand that based on 246 years of trauma, let me, let me just kind of explain trauma to you. You all know what post-traumatic stress disorder is, right? Right. And we also know that the people that are diagnosed with it are these folks up here. Rape victims, war veterans, heart attack victims, victims of natural disasters, victims of severe accidents. Right. So how does something that happened so many years ago impact us now? How many of you know how to cook in the room? Who taught you? Yeah, somebody in your environment taught you, huh? And guess who taught them? Right, that's called social learning theory, it's not deep. You learn from the significant others in your environment. So, not only did we experience 246 years of trauma, unhealed, 
Because when they raped you or they sold off your children or they beat you or branded you or lynched you or whatever they did, did we get any treatment for those 246? Did Dr. Phil come? No, that'd be no. After slavery ended, officially, did we get some treatment then? Now, is it plausible that we escape post-traumatic stress disorder? Look at the diagnostic criteria. A serious threat to or harm to one's life or physical integrity. Did we get that before and after slavery? You bet we did. Threat or harm to one's children, spouse, or close. We got all of those. Stressors considered, disorders considered to be more serious and will last longer when the stressors of human design. This is straight out of the DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. But we don't have post-traumatic stress disorder today. Our ancestors did. And they exhibited those behaviors. Think about it. Exaggerated startle response, hypervigilance, difficulty concentrating, irritability, outbursts of anger. Well, I'm in that environment. I don't know mama's broken, so guess what is being modeled for me? Broken behavior. And guess what you all call it now? Cultural. That's just that culture. This is how we are. Well, there's poison in the cookies. There's poison in what was cultural because part of it's adaptive. That's how it got passed along. And by the way, we experience traumas too. It's not like the trauma stopped. Let's look at it. After slavery ended, did the traumas end? Okay, so let's do the math. 246 years of trauma, no help. Free, no help, more trauma. We're amazing people. We're amazing. Because we got this far with no help. And then people say, well, I don't understand why you limp. Well, you broke my leg. That's why. And so when I think about it, I looked at it in these different areas, and I won't cover those. Those are in the book and in my research, but I'm going to end with some examples of what it looks like. How many of you have heard the term good hair? You took it out, didn't you? I hate you. <laughs> my well, my daughter had to. I have to do it. I beat her up because, you know, I have to. Because, uh, <laughs> No, she took out the slides because I have so many of them. But you know, you've heard the term good hair, right? As a matter of fact, we had to have a movie recently about good hair. And I'm real mad at Chris Rock, and I'm certain I'll meet him. Uh, because he didn't explain the etiology of why we have issues around our hair. Because we've been told our hair is bad. Matter of fact, please don't let anybody white have you come up and go, you're not going to, you're going to go natural? You mean you're going to leave it like that? You know, I can see your roots. Nobody does that to white people. But we've been told that intrinsically there's something wrong with our hair, hence post-traumatic slave syndrome. That's what good hair is about. But let me give you a picture of it. There's a white mother and a black mother, 2011. They both have sons. It's not gender specific. It could be male or female. They have two sons. They find themselves at a school meeting. The sons know each other, spend the night, best friends. Black mother leans over to the white mother and says, you know, I just want to tell you, I've noticed that your son is really doing well. And the white mother responds, thank you so much for noticing that I mentioned he's in TAG, the Talent and the Gifted Program. You know, he also won the science fair last week. You know, his uncle is an astronaut. The boy's just brilliant. She's proud. I'm not mad. Excellent. So then the white mother, this is 2011, re remembers in, in, that her, the black woman's son is actually excelling her son. So she leans over and she goes, what am I saying? Your son? That boy's really coming along. Black mother's response, 2011. Girl, yeah, you think so, but woo, that boy, woo, Lord, that boy worked my nerves. He's something else. Now, if you're black in the room, you smile it because you know that's what you've heard your whole life. Or, oh, yeah, oh, I hear what you're saying, but woo, Lord, I tripped that boo yesterday, I went, mm. So the white response is, gosh, they're so negative. Now what black people know, and Latinos do it too, but what black people know is that she's really proud the whole time she's saying that. Now, when I want black people and black people in the audience, I'm a clinician. That's not healthy behavior. Are you hearing me? It's not healthy to say that when someone pra praises your child. But let's give it context. Let's move it back 300 years. Black mother in the fields or in the kitchen, she has her children around. White slave owner, male or female, walks through and says to them, my, my, that boy, that boy yours, he's sure coming along. What is she gonna say? Oh no, sir, no, sir, he's stupid, he's shiftless, he can't work, because I don't want you to sell my boy. 
If it's my daughter, I don't want you to breed her. So I denigrate them to protect them. That is called appropriate adaptation for living in a hostile environment. When did we unlearn it? Poison in the cookies. So now little, little Trey Beyonce, little Trey looks at his mama and thinks and says, how come you can't be proud of me, mama? Because you see, now we're injuring him. Are you following me? Post-traumatic slave syndrome. So, 2011, 1994, I went to Africa. 1994, my first trip to Africa, on the heels of the inauguration of Nelson Mandela. It was an emotional experience because it was the first time in my life it felt normal to be black. And I had people, how many people have seen black people do this? <laughs> Walking down the street. And so my white friends and family go, Joy, you know so many people. I go, I don't know those people. <laughs> but in Africa, there's actually a phrase, and it's, I see you. Interesting, Avatar picked it up. <laughs> yeah, it's actually an African phrase in the tribal languages. I see you, it's a greeting. So I cried a lot when I was in Africa. I mean, I cried a lot, because I was so emotional. You could tell I'm emotional, you think a little bit? <laughs> so I cried a lot, right? So I was traveling with eight other African-American women, and it's a powerful thing, because in an audience this size, when I would cry, no one would give me a tissue. Everyone would stand and sing in four-part harmony. They just immediately stand and sing you back, which is, I can't tell you what that felt like. Only there's a problem, because after they sing, they expect you to offer a few tunes as well. <laughs> and contrary to popular opinion, we can't all sing. <laughs> so the women in my group were getting a little tired of me. And they had a little meeting without me because we were on our way to Lesotho and they told my sister who was with us that she's going to have to talk to me because they said, Iris, you need to talk to her because we, we are not singing in Lesotho. <laughs> so I woke up, my sister was sitting next to me. She goes, Joy, you know we're going to Lesotho today. I said, yeah, I know. She goes, we're not singing in Lesotho. So whatever you need to do to get your little self together, we need you to do that because we're not singing in Lesotho. Are we clear? <laughs> I'm good. So we go to Lesotho and the, the actual room was twice the size with people from every walk of life, villages from the government, from education, coming to greet these nine African-American women. So we're, on this, we're seated on the stage. Everybody's looking at me, because everybody black knows the death stare. I wish you would. <laughs> so I was the first one to get up, and they were looking at me like, don't even, ooh. <laughs> don't even. So I said my name, hello, my name is Joy. I'm traveling with eight other African-American women. We're building a corridor with our African sisters here in the southern region of Africa. And I sat on down. I felt good about myself. No tears, no singing. Everything went well. So the interpreter gets up, translates into Afrikaans, and then all of a sudden, you know, he starts going on and on. And on and on and on and on and on. And, on. and then the people start clapping. Then they start chanting and stomping their feet. So everybody's looking at me going, So I go over. I said, you know, what did you say? He says, I told him what you said. I said, I didn't say all that. <laughs> He says, no, when I got to the place where I told them that you were African-American, some of the people are from remote villages, and they, and they thought all Americans were white. So then I had to explain to them that you were the descendants of the ones that had been stolen away, and they were saying to you, welcome home, welcome home. And of course, everyone was singing because I was tore up. <laughs> and this woman in the back of the audience, of course, my sister's going, I can't. <laughs> Everybody's on their feet. This woman way in the back starts making her way towards me because I'm, I'm crying. Everybody's singing. She had actually studied in the United States at UCLA or SC, I think. She grabbed me by the hand and she said to me, did you think we would forget you? She says, I am from Lesotho and Lesotho is my home. If I leave Lesotho, Lesotho is still my home. If I leave Lesotho for 50 years, Lesotho, is still my home. We mourned Martin, and we mourned Malcolm with you. We're so very proud of you. You are African 300 years from home. We just wondered when you were coming back. Let the healing begin. Thank you so very much.
Can you hear me? We want to thank Dr. Joy for coming in and spending time here at Building Bridges with us um, and sharing her message. As custom with Building Bridges, we'd like to open up the floor for two or three questions before we move on to lunch and so on and so forth in the workshops. So there's a microphone that Maya has on this side of the room, and I'll take the first question on this side of the room if anyone has one. Does anybody have a question? I'll ask the first one. What was the event that caused you to do the work? The event. Um, this actually, uh, the book uh, is a culmination of nine years of research. Um, and I specifically looked at African American male youth violence. I, this thing is weird to me. I don't know. What, do I have it on wrong? <laughs> that could be it. It's speaking to the back of my head. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you can tell I have no technological. Okay, so um, what happened was I was looking at African American male youth violence. And the event that really struck me was when I came back from South Africa, <clears throat> my, um, I was depressed uh, because you know, I came back to being marginalized and invisible. Um, and so one day I was at home and people were inquiring about whether I had gone out of the house yet, and I hadn't. Because I felt actually more racism in the Portland airport than the whole time I was in South Africa. And um, one day my daughter, my younger daughter, not the one in the audience, ran in to the house and she said to me, Mom, there's a, there's, a, there's a boy outside. He's gonna beat up Nadine, that's my son and her brother, and he's gonna pee on the car too. So I had to go outside. So I go outside and standing there are a little group of, of black boys, nobody's over 10. And my son is standing there and I can tell he's scared but he's trying to hold his own. So I walk over to the, the little boy who seems to be the kind of leader, and I said, has my son done something to you that I need to know about? He goes, yeah, I want to know if he got some kind of eyeball problem. I said, what did you say? He said, I want to know if he got some kind of eyeball problem, what he's staring at. I said, wait a minute, you want to beat up my son because he was looking at you? He could have been looking at you because he thought maybe you want to come in and play a little Nintendo game. He could have been looking at you because look down the street there's a park. Maybe he thought you could go kick it at the park. He could have been looking at you. Look at the little hoop out here. Maybe he thought you could play a little one on one. So all these little kids are looking at me like, whoa, lady. I <laughs> got therapeutic on him. So I gave him my spiel about how we can't fight each other. We've got to stop this. But that's where post traumatic was born because you see, Africa was saying, I see you. And African Americans were going, what you looking at? What? What? What could have happened to a 10-year-old boy that he could not withstand a gaze? And what did he believe about that gaze? Because I'm not who I think I am. And I'm not who you think I am. I am who I think that you think that I am. That's how we arrive at our self-concept, by the appraisals of significant others in our environment. So what did he believe was staring back at him that he wanted to beat my son bloody for? Because whatever it was he saw, not reflected in white eyes, but in black eyes, reminded him of what he hated most, and that was himself. And that's where post-traumatic was born. I said, everybody's been created with, to be given respect and dignity. What was happening to this little boy, this fragile little child, that he so hated the reflection in the mirror? That's what made it come alive for me, that I needed to look at a concept called vacant esteem one of the symptoms of post-traumatic. Thank you. Is there another question in the audience? <coughs> one down here. Hi. Um, first, I just want to say thank you. I'm so overwhelmed by what you've helped me to connect with. Um, I, I believe that part of the reason um, President Obama isn't being as successful as he could be is that he's black. And because of all we've learned about, especially those people who would dress like Thomas Jefferson if it was still that era, 
they're all ingrained in that. Do you do you think that that's true, or do you think it's just political? Okay, so here, here's the thing, and there's something called post-racial America because of the election of President Barack Obama. Um, the statistics on overrepresentation have not changed. The health disparities have not changed. The economic gulf has not changed. The achievement gap has not changed. Okay, but what you have to understand, because of the dissonance, what the average white American wants to do is go, ah, okay, so everything's fine now. You see, but there's been no exchange of power. Truly, there's been no exchange of policy. The structural racism is very much intact, and in fact, is rearing its ugly head very well. Hence, the Tea Party. So we really know. Matter of fact, we were driving on our way here. Uh, I forget the name of the, what was the, what was her name that drove us? Lindsay drove us here. And we, we, we were driving, and on the left side was uh, a Confederate flag in the window of the truck next to us that looked over at her. They looked over at her and saw my daughter and I in the car. And, you know, then came, started looking, you know, kind of, kind of kind of darting in and out looking at us. Now this is 2011. Now you have to understand what a Confederate flag and a noose mean to me. See, a Confederate flag says I wish you would have lost, which means that if we would have won, you would still be slaves. The fact that they're arguing for a license plate for Confederate heroes says it's almost tantamount to someone saying Hitler is our general, you know, our, our, our hero, German hero. We should be able to put his, him on a license plate. See, but all of these things are contemporary and they're raising them and they're all, and people thought they were way over there. It's showing up everywhere. So the truth of the matter is, it's not either or, it's and. Yes, we are progressing. Yes, look at this audience. Yes, we're beginning to deal with issues, but we are far, far from having achieved anything close, hence human trafficking. We're far from having achieved the myth of inclusion, the illusion of inclusion. It's, you know, we got a lot of work to do. And I still have to concern myself about where my sons are right now, whether they startle a white woman, whether they will walk away from a police interaction alive. I've got to worry about that with all my PH or D. I can't protect them. So. Last, one last question on this side here. Um, my question to you is, now that you've written your book and have kind of given us a little bit more open mind about post-traumatic syndrome. What sort of controversy have you faced as you continue to do research, and how have you combated it? Honestly, I don't, I don't face any controversy. And I think when people hear about my work and don't read about it, I mean, you know, again, they, they get all upset and twisted because they're scared when they hear the term post-traumatic slave syndrome. Anyone that knows my work, I've never had anyone, because it's not, it's not debatable. You know, I'm not, I'm not sharing anything that's not history, right? So I don't, I don't really entertain that. The other thing is I don't care. <laughs> uh, I can't, you know, um, because there are even black people. To give you an example, I did a talk at um, Oxford University. I was one of 35 people in the world invited to present at Oxford University. And when I got there, what was most interesting was the response of black scholars, 35 of us from around the world talking about discrimination and oppression. Uh, you had people representing Holocaust, you had people representing Japanese internment, issues with Irish, Irish um, Catholics and all of that. You had different people representing discrimination, Latinos, um, migrant workers, all kinds of things. You know? So I was among other black scholars, some of whom were from Africa, some from Duke University. These are people actually at the time very much more accomplished than myself in terms of uh, scholarship. Uh, but I was interesting to see their behavior towards me. And I'll give you a perfect example of that if you want to know where it shows up. Because some people think post-traumatic slave syndrome, the behaviors are class, you know, education derived. Okay, so now we're talking about people very well educated. So the first day, we're in the Harry Potter room. True. Really. And I was looking around and people said, yes, it is the Harry Potter room. So we are, um, and we have, you know, each person, I kept thinking the whole time there's been a mistake, they must not know who I am. I kept thinking I accidentally got put in there, they're going to tell me to go home. But I, they, they actually took my, um, you know, my abstract and wanted me to present, and each abstract was bound, topic, person that's given the talk, in a little leather thing, so each person walking by during this, you know, kind of greet and meet thing could see who was presenting and what they were presenting. Now, I'm a social scientist, 
and I'm always looking at human behavior, including yours. I always watch human behavior. Um, it's just, and part of it's being black, you always gotta watch human behavior. Um, and part of what I noticed was how people responded to my topic. So I'm watching white people walk by with their little, you know, wine and cheese, and they would, they would go by and they'd be, post-traumatic, interesting. That's interesting. Right? This is what general white response is. Oh, I'm looking for interesting. Black response. These, this is what black people do. They're breathing. They're looking to see who it is. Because they, they're not going to sit next to whoever is doing this. You think I'm kidding. They're, they're looking. She might be one, two black. What if she's too black? What if she upsets the white people? Hell, I'm here in Oxford. I can't associate. Oh, no, I'm not going to have her upset the white people. So they were not going to sit next to me and didn't. So I'm at the table. We finally get seated. You can hear crickets where I was. No black people sat next to me. One black man actually sat next to me. And he was a black nationalist pan-African who had been insulting people in their language. <laughs> and I didn't know if I wanted to sit next to him. So the next day when I was getting ready to present, now it's time to present, right? Now they, they distanced themselves. I'm talking about not only officially, but you know, after, even afterwards, they just didn't want to have anything. They just wanted the white people to know we're not with her. So I'm getting ready to present, and I've got my little stuff like this. I only have 20 minutes, so you can imagine what, how crunched I was. So I had 20 minutes, and before I could talk, they said, oh, wait, wait, hold it. We have two people who have already reviewed your work. So I got my little stuff ready, and the two people, just like here, exactly, as a matter of fact, the setup is exactly the same. So these are two strangers that have already reviewed my work and are getting ready to report on it before I get to do anything here. So I go, okay. So I sat on down, and they stand up, they have their little notes, they have my book, and they start talking about how this should be mandatory in every aspect of study. They said this is seminal work. They go on and on to such a degree the facilitator cuts them off. He said, stop, we don't stop it, right? At which point, suddenly, all the black people start going. <laughs> <laughs> right, so what's happened now is they need a white approval, do you see? Now, they couldn't accept me on the merit of my work until white people approved it. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. And then they wanted to hang with me, at which point I didn't let them. <laughs> but, but, but again, part of that is, again, unless, unless you have the white endorsement, it can't be real, right? I don't ask white people permission to look at myself. And I don't ask their opinion of what I've looked at. Now, they may have opinions, and that's okay, but this song isn't about you. This song is about healing people who have never had a chance to look at them. So, yeah, there may be controversy out there. I don't know. It's never showed up with me. You know, it just, it just never has. But even black people are backing up because it seems too intense. We don't want to upset white people. We've, even in audiences like this, I've had people trying to take care of the white people in the room. Black people start looking around to see if the white people are upset and say, well, I think what she's saying is, I go, no, you don't have to tell them. I know what I said. But they're trying to take, because that's what we've been taught. Don't, don't let people, white people, get upset. I might lose my job. You know what I mean? And so I had to get over that because the issue of healing is more important than all that stuff. I don't know if I answered that. <laughs> well, I want to thank Dr. Joy again. Thank you.